There we go. Thank you for that. So, let's begin. So we've already had a little bit of experience with doing network communication because we've been using RFCOM over Bluetooth to talk to our Arduino devices. RFCOM is the fancy name for doing serial over Bluetooth um, or over IP, whichever kind of transport medium you want to be using at that time. Because serial over Bluetooth is really similar to TCP IP, we're not going to be in much trouble because there's not going to be that much more or that many more concepts to learn. The same drawbacks and the same problems will be, uh, will be there for both of these two transport mechanisms. So we're going to be doing things like connecting to ports, dealing with streams, etc. We're going to be using Data Reader, that guy that uh, was in the lecture slides last, year, last week about uh, dealing with Bluetooth, etc. Then we're going to take a slightly higher level approach because we don't always want to be dealing with sending bits and bytes over the wire, and we want to deal at a slightly higher level uh, where we have objects that are already built to deal with these specific protocols. So we're going to be taking a look at uh, this thing called HTTP client, and we'll be dealing with that, which will give us a better way to do things like connect to web services and such. And hopefully, by the end of this lecture, we'll be doing live speech recognition, where we're able to use sound I.O. to capture audio, and then we can take that audio and upload it to a Google web service endpoint, which will do speech-to-text translation for us, and we'll get that text back in a text format that we can display to the user. And that's going to be kind of our cloud computation uh, example. So let's go ahead and talk about TCP IP. So TCP IP provides what's called reliable end-to-end -end data transmission. So reliable means that if something bad happens to the data as you've sent it, it gets retransmitted many, many times. So something bad happening can be anything from you walk out of range with your phone from a Wi-Fi endpoint, or from a Wi-Fi access point, so your Wi-Fi packets can no longer make it to the, uh, to the access point, which means that your phone has to switch over to using 4G. That kind of logic happens at a lower level than TCP IP. So TCP will just keep on trying to resend packets until it gets responses from the server saying that, yes, I did indeed get that last packet you sent. It's end-to-end, -end, which means that we don't have to worry about anything in the middle. We just say we want to connect to Google.com, and the fact that our packet goes from our phone to the Wi-Fi router to a networked router somewhere in the EE building to the router that, uh, that provides all of the University of Washington internet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it, we don't care about that at all. All that gets taken care of by the underlying IP layer. Um, and we also have the concept of a session, which means that we have to explicitly connect and then once we've connected, our session is available, and we're able to transmit data in both receiving and transmitting. So this is in contrast to other transport mechanisms, such as UDP. UDP is not uh, reliable, and it has no concept of a session, which means that when you send a packet, it's just gone, and there's no way of knowing whether it was actually uh, received or not. You may think that this is not very desirable, but there are actually a lot of uses for UDP. Everything from uh, video games to uh, some uh, like voice conferencing kind of applications where you don't really care if one or two packets were dropped, so you just want to keep on sending packets as fast as you possibly can, and you'll make it up later somehow. But all of these transport mechanisms make use of what we call sockets, and sockets are bound to a port number. The reason we have these things called port numbers is because we may want to, at some point, have multiple applications on a single device be able to use the internet at the same time. That's kind of an under understatement. We usually have tens, if not hundreds, of applications all using the networking devices all at the same time. And port numbers allow us to disambiguate which packets are going to which uh, applications on your computer. So for instance, when you want to connect to Google.com, you'll connect on port 80, because that's the standard port for HTTP web traffic. When you want to connect to an FTP server, you connect on port 21. When you want to connect to an SMTP mail server, you connect to port 23, and so on and so forth. There are 65,535 different possible ports that you can have on your computer, and um, commu setting up a service and communicating with it is often just as easy as figuring out which number you want to use, and just using that number. 
there's a really, really large number of numbers that aren't reserved for any specific service. Usually the ports be below 1,000 are uh, typically spoken for, but anything above 1,000, if you want to make some great service that needs web communication, that needs uh, internet communication, and it's not explicitly any of the other services, you're writing your own protocol and stuff, you can just grab port 5,000 or whatever. And chances are there's no other process using that port, and you're going to be able to use that port for your communications. So TCP sockets can either listen or connect. If you're listening, then that means you're a server and you're waiting for connections to come in. If you're connecting, then you need to connect to a socket that's already listening. So for instance, at google.com, there is a socket listening at port 80 right now. And I can make a connection request to that port and set up a session. In order to start a listening socket, you do what's called bind it to a port. That means you tell the socket you're going to listen on this port, on this address, on this interface, and then when someone tries to connect to you, notify me. And that's exactly what we're going to do in a little bit. Connecting sockets are always the initiators of the connection, and uh, of course you have to tell it what address and what port you want it to connect to. You can't just say, you know, connect to a port and not give it an address, because it needs to know which uh, IP address it's trying to connect to. And due to the nature of phones, we tend to do more, a lot more connecting than listening. Today we are going to learn how to listen to, for a connection, but most phones don't walk around with services running, on, running around in your pocket, waiting for people to connect to it. It does happen, but just because phones tend to be the instigators of most uh, actions, you will more than likely do a lot more connecting on your phone than you will do listening. Listening tends to happen on servers, desktop computers, that kind of thing. So, when you want to do TCP listening, we're going to use this class called a stream socket listener, and it exposes a connection received event. We'll first call bind service name async and give it a port number to start listening. And once we've done that, and, and we've subscribed to the connection received event, everything happens inside the event handler. Someone will try to connect to this port number, and then it will fire off the whatever event handler that we've assigned to that connection received event, and then we get to do whatever it is we want to do. Send data to the person who connected to us, read in data that the person who connected to us sent, all that kind of stuff. We're passed in a object of type stream socket listener connection received event args, which is just incredibly long and obtuse, but uh, at least it's at the very least descriptive. And inside this object, we get a socket member. And that socket object will have an input stream and an output stream. So we can construct a data reader, just like we have for files and just like we did for doing Bluetooth communication, and we can read in data and send out data using that input stream and output stream. For connecting, it's pretty similar to how we did it over Bluetooth, except that we're not going to use the Peer Finder class. If you want to, you can go ahead and look for documentation and examples, and those are links, so you don't even have to Google search it. And what that Peer Finder class will allow you to do is things like, if you don't know the IP address of uh, whoever you want to connect to, you can have the Peer Finder class broadcast out information saying, hey, I am application XYZ, I live on port ABC, and you can connect to me here. And what that will do is it will allow you to do things like broadcast your presence on your local Wi-Fi, and if someone else opens your same app and also has the Peer Finder uh, logic inside of it, then those two devices will both broadcast their presence and they'll be able to find each other. This is really useful for things like, um, well, there's, there are a lot of apps that do things like this. For instance, uh, that back when the iPhone first came out, there was an application where you could bump phones with someone else and you would swap contact information. This is the kind of way that you would do that. You would have both of the phones broadcasting the fact that they both have the bump app open. And when you bump, they will try and communicate with each other. And if they can, then they know that the other person who you just bumped with is the person that you just bumped with. And they'll be able to find the addresses of those uh, phones and do communication over Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. Um, I believe the way the original app worked was actually over 4G, but that, uh, that's not quite using the same tactic here. So, um, everybody understand why you might want to use 
this peer finder class because we're not going to actually do it today. We're going to have to manually enter in the IP addresses because that's simpler. And when I say manually type in the IP addresses, I mean right here when we construct this host name object, we'll pass in this thing called host name string. So creating this host name object allows us to call connect async, which we pass in a port and this host name object. And then that gives that connects our stream socket and we're ready to do work. So all of this talk about connecting and listening and stuff, it, real, it really boils down to just a few lines. For connecting, it's just these three lines. We create a stream socket, we have the address we want to connect to in the port, and then we connect it, and then we're ready to start transmitting and receiving. That's the connection-specific code. For the listening-specific code, we do bind async, and we subscribe to this connection-received event. And that's the listening-specific code. Everything beyond that is shared between connecting and receiving because we're just doing writing uh, bytes and reading bytes. So let's take a look at what raw TCP IP communication looks like. Uh, in the week six materials folder, which isn't updated yet, but it will be, we have three projects. We have one called raw server, one called raw client, and one called HTTP client. So let's take a look at raw server for a minute. Inside raw server, uh, let's take a look at the XAML first to see what it looks like. We are going to have a text block, or sorry, text box, which is the text that we will respond with when someone connects to us. We have a port number that we'll listen to, and we have a start button saying that, yes, we're going to start listening and accept connections once people connect to us. In the C-sharp code, uh, we have a, let's go to the uh, code that gets run when we click on the button. So that is, where is it? Listen button click. When I click listen button, the first time I click it, it says start. And when I do that, then it will say stop afterwards. So that's why we have this if text, button, text input dot enabled thing. This, this determines whether we're starting or stopping. And we say, okay, we're going to start a listener and output some t some er some text if it error if it uh, throws an exception. And if we are able to listen, we say, okay, we're listening on port this port on IP addresses, and then we have some code to find all the IP addresses on this device and print them out. So if I were to run this and press that start button, we will see listening on port 5040 on IP addresses, and then it gives me two different addresses. The reason it gives me two different addresses is because phones have multiple network interfaces. You have, at a minimum, Wi-Fi and 3G. It's possible you can have even more. There are, there are network, uh, network interfaces for what's called a loopback interface, which is where if you have one application on the phone that wants to talk to a different application, that kind of thing, although that's typically not allowed on phones, but it is allowed for sure on desktops. Um, this address right here is an address that won't be able to communicate to it. Won't be able to communicate to the outside world, but this one will be. 192.168.123.130. Some of you may remember, you may recognize this 192.168 kind of thing. That's a, that's a prefix that's pretty common for internal network addresses, like on a, on a, a wireless network and such. So, now that we've started this, we should be able to connect to port 5040 on this device and actually communicate with it. But we're not going to do that quite yet. First, we're going to take a look at what this start listener method does. Start listener is right here, and it's just four lines. The first thing it does is it constructs a stream socket listener. It uh, subscribes to the connection received event. It binds to a certain port. In this case, we're grabbing the text from the port text box and passing it in. And then we just return this listener object, which is the stream socket listener. And so you may already have figured out that this listener connection received function is where all the fun stuff is going on. Let's take a look at that. Minimum. Make you small, make you small, make you small. 
make you small. Listener connection received. This is what gets called whenever a new, uh, a new client connects to this port. The first thing it does is it reads in a message from the socket object. This read HTTP message thing we'll go over a little bit later, but it's a function that will actually use the data reader, data writer, all that kind of stuff to read in a string uh, depending on a certain protocol that we've defined as to how we're going to be communicating between each other. And yes, it will be HTTP-like. We're going to display the message that we received to the user. So we'll say we received a connection from, and then we do this really long chain of dots to, to grab the name of the remote uh, user. So when someone connects this, it will say, hey, I received a connection from this IP address. And then it will print out the message. After that, we grab, we make a data writer for off of the output stream, and then we write out the response text, where the response text is whatever we've typed in right here. And then we store it with this store async thing, which we've also seen from the Bluetooth communication. So I'm going to go ahead and start up a, the server on this phone right here. Um, or at least I would if I had it installed. So let me go ahead and install it real quick. And then we're going to run the client on the emulator and connect to the server on the, uh, on the phone. All right, we've got the TCP IP server running on the phone. So let's go over here and switch over to raw client instead of raw server. Raw client is similarly simple. We ask for a host name, a port number, and then whatever we're going to send to that address. And then we have a button that says send, and then any response will be printed out down here in this text box. Taking a brief look at the code, we have this connect socket function, which looks an awful lot like the uh, startup listener function. We create a stream socket, we create a host name, we tell it to connect, and we tell it to return the socket. We have a send data function that takes in a socket to send on. So we'll construct a data writer. We'll grab our payload, which is the input text object text property. We do this funny little thing so that it court so that it follows the protocol that we're going to define that we still haven't actually defined yet. This protocol basically says, at the end of every message, it's going to end with a slash r slash n slash r slash n. What that corresponds to is two new lines, which is what all HTTP messages end with. And so this says, all right, if this payload string doesn't already end with those, add them on at the end. This payload.substring thing grabs a substring of a string, and it starts at payload.length minus four, and it's four elements long. So hopefully that's pretty clear to everybody. Finally, we write it out, and I guess I don't actually need to store this written thing, and we store it. Read HTTP message is exactly the same as it is in the other, uh, in the other one, and we just won't talk about it quite yet. Finally, we have the send button click event handler. So the first thing we do is we try to connect. So we call this connect socket thing, which we saw back up here, that four line method that looks a lot like the open listener function. We give it the text and the, and the port. We try to send our payload with send data, and we try and get the response with read HTTP message. All of these functions are wrapped in try catch blocks where we, have, where we try to, to do it, and if it doesn't work, we catch the exception and we print out the error message. And that's because errors can happen at any one of these um, points. When we're trying to connect the socket, we could try to connect to, a, to the wrong host. 
and it doesn't have a service listening on that port, and so it doesn't respond to our connection requests. For the sending the payload, we could try to send it, and it could fail, 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 and then eventually uh, reach some threshold where it won't even try anymore, and at that point it will notify us, hey, we couldn't actually send this. For getting the response, we could try to read something in, and the, uh, and the server could never send anything back. And so we could either choose to wait there forever for, for data, or we could error out after some threshold. Lots and lots of possible errors when you're dealing with network, network programming. But what we eventually want to get at is we want to display the response as the output text. So let's throw this onto the emulator and see if we can get the response that we want from the TCP IP server. So if you remember, when the TCP IP server starts up, it has a big text box, which is the predefined message that we want to send. And in this case, the predefined message is hello there. So let me just grab the IP address for that, uh, for that phone. 173.250.173. If I press insert, I wish my Mac had an insert button. Do you know what it is on a Mac? <laughs> Page up. I don't think I have that one either, but I can try function up. No, nope, that doesn't seem to work. Oh well. Luckily, we won't have to do this too many times. I run on port 5040 because I like the number 5040 because it's divisible by a lot of numbers. And so then when we said send raw, it flashes connecting, and then it says receiving, and then it says hello there, which is what the TCP IP server is configured to send back. Let's try it having the TCP IP server on this side and see if we can't, uh, you know, I really wish I could open, oh, I bet I can open two of these actually. That would be pretty neat. Let's see if clicking on that thing like that worked. No, nope, it doesn't like it when I start it like that. Let me try switching back to raw server and instead telling it to run on a different emulator and seeing if that works. Hopefully we'll get two phones here and they can talk back and forth to each other. The reason why I don't want to run the server on um, on the emulator and then try to connect to it from the phone is because the emulator runs on a private internal network that's run by the virtual machine that's running the emulator and I'm not certain that we're going to be able to uh, connect to it from the outside world. Not enough memory in the system to start the virtual machine. Well that's just too bad. Let's try running... nope that won't work. Well, it looks like I don't have enough memory in my computer to run both at the same time. So we're just going to try running the server and see if we can connect to it from the outside world properly. Does it have port forwards in here? It doesn't. So yeah, this won't work because I won't be able to connect to either of these uh, port to either of these IP addresses, I don't think. Let me just check to make sure that my IP address isn't one of those that it's, that it's talking about. Yeah, no, it's not. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to show you guys the TCP IP server right here. And you guys can take a look at this if you want. And we'll just run the client on here again, and you can see the you can see the text appear on here as I send stuff to it. So when I start the server, it's got no, it's got just a little bit of text down there telling me which uh, IP address is uh, being shown there. And when I press send raw to the IP address, you know, I said I wouldn't have to type it multiple times, but there I go having to type it multiple times. One seven three dot two fifty. Let's use my right hand. Dot one seven three dot eight. Port fifty forty. 
And so when I say send raw, it adds a new line of text down there. So every time I say send raw, it will add another line of text. And so now we have three lines of text down there at the bottom. And those lines of text are what we're typing in right here. So this hopefully gets, drives home the point that yes, we are actually communicating over TCP IP. The question is, what exactly are we communicating? Because as I said before, we're using some kind of protocol to know when a message starts and when it stops. And I mentioned that it was that slash r slash n slash r slash n thing. So let's talk a little bit about, what, about why I chose that and why that's important to choose. The reason is because when you use a stream socket, there's no way of knowing exactly when a message starts and stops. When I send out a packet that's 1,000 bytes long, it could be that somewhere along the path of me sending out the packet and it getting to its destination, it comes across a network uh, link that is unable to transmit all 1,000 bytes at a time. So it may chop it up into a 800 byte message and a 200 byte message. This happens a lot. And in fact, most of the messages that you're actually going to want to send are going to need to be chopped up many, many times because the maximum transmit unit of many wireless, of many, uh, like, uh, of many internet links is measured in the thousands of bytes, like 1,400 bytes, not in the megabytes, which we very often transmit. So when we send a message, there's no guarantee that it will arrive in one big piece. And when pieces arrive at the network endpoint, the endpoint is immediately able to start reading in those bytes that have been uh, received because it has no idea when a message starts and when it stops. Well, I guess it does have an idea of when it starts. That's the first bytes that it receives. But it doesn't know when a message stops. So if I send 1,000 bytes, it could be that on the receiving end, first they receive 800 bytes, and so they read those in, and then they will receive 200 bytes a couple milliseconds later. So protocols are our answer to this problem. Protocols allow us to do things like determine how long a message is going to be, and the way HTTP does it is it ends everything with two new lines. So let's talk about HTTP a little bit more before we get into the nitty gritty. Um, it's a stateless request response text-based protocol. Stateless meaning that nothing is stored on, no, no state is stored on the server. Every time you make a request, you have to give all the information that you, that you need the server to have in order to complete that request. This means things like if you are logging into your bank, right? First you get to the login page and there's nothing specific to you, right? So you enter in your login details, you send those login details, it responds and says, okay, you're authenticated. Then you say, okay, give me the balance in my Cayman Island accounts, right? When you say that, it needs some way of knowing who you are because this request saying, give me the balance in my accounts, it has no way of linking that to the previous request saying, please log me in. And so this is where the concept of things called cookies come in. Cookies are little bits of information that are stored on the client side and they get sent to the server every single time you make a request. So when I log in, it says, okay, you're authenticated, here's your authentication token. So then you take your token and you store it in your, um, on your local computer. Then when you try to make a request to say, okay, give me my account balance, you give it the authentication token along with your request. And that's how the web server is able to look at its database and say, aha, this authentication token matches this person's balance, request, balance, so we'll give it to them. If you have the wrong authentication token, it won't give you anything. That's, what, that's literally what cookies are. They're just little bits of information that get stored on your browser, dictated by the web server. This protocol is uh, request response, which means that the client always initiates and the server always responds. And there have actually been a lot of technologies built up to get around this certain limitation, because oftentimes you do want the server to communicate something to the uh, client without the client explicitly asking for it. For instance, when you're in Gmail and you're sitting there with the window open, somehow your uh, somehow your web browser knows at some point that there's a new message. And it's not like you're, click, you're sitting there hitting the refresh button over and over. I mean, you might be, 
but that's not exactly the most efficient way to check for new email. Um, so technologies of called like, for instance, WebSockets or AJAX or a very specific function, which is XML HTTP request, which was the original progenitor of all this kind of uh, server to client communication, um, has sprung up in order to fill this void. So the techniques range from the really simple, which is where you make a request to the server, and the, reserve, and the server knows that you're asking to say, are there any new messages? And if there aren't any new messages, then it just doesn't respond. And it keeps on not responding until there is a message to give back to you. And the way that you make this work is the client has a, sets a timeout for the request, you know, says, give me a new message, and then it will wait for like two minutes. And at the end of two minutes, the connection dies because eventually all connections die if there's no traffic. And then you make a new request. And so you keep on asking, keep on asking, keep on asking. The magic is that the server just doesn't respond until it actually has a message. This is called long polling, and it's not the most elegant solution, but it does work in like all web browsers ever. Uh, well, I guess all web browsers since IE6. <laughs> um, building on top of this, you have things like Ajax, you have things like WebSockets and such. WebSockets are, are relatively new, and they're pretty cool because they allow two-way communication, period. So you can actually have like two web browsers connect to each other directly and start talking to each other, which is kind of cool. Uh, but we're not going to cover any of that. Uh, every response that you get from an HTTP request starts with an HTTP status code. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, for instance, 404 file not found. Um, if there's a list of status codes that tell you what different things mean. And the one that you always want is 200 OK. 200 means I got your response, I got your request, and I was able to fulfill it. Here's the answer. 500 means something horribly wrong went on inside the web server. It's not even a normal error. This is like the uh, our house is burning down error. And there are different kinds of request types that can be made as well. There's the head request, the get request, and the post request. Those are the, the, the three most common. These different requests allow you to do different things. For instance, you can say you can get sent a head request and say, hey, I want the metadata about a file on your server. So if you want to do things like know when the last time a file was changed, r rather than getting the entire file, you can say you can send HTTP head. Uh, if you want to get the file, the actual file, you can send a get request. And if you want to send some data to the server, you can send a post request. <coughs> and all of these can fail with 404s, 500s, all that kind of stuff. So let's do a really quick example and show what, a, what this kind of thing looks like. Uh, do I have something better? Oh, well, I guess, yeah, I guess we should talk about this first. Um, every HTTP H, every HTTP message has headers, which is a little bit of metadata about this message that we're about to send that precedes all the other messages, both requests and responses. And it's going to give us a lot of useful information, like, for instance, even though I said that every HTTP message ends with slash r slash n, slash r slash n, that's one way we can know that the entire message is done. The other way we can know is that oftentimes there will be a content length entry in the HTTP header that will tell us how long the, the message payload that they're sending is. And that's the reason why sometimes when you download a file off the internet, it's able to say, I have downloaded five megabytes out of 100 megabytes. And other times, it just says, I have downloaded five megabytes, and it doesn't know how many more megabytes there are to download. The difference between those two is that some servers are giving them the content length, other servers aren't. Reasons why you wouldn't give the content length are if you don't know how big the content is. It could be that you are sending out a live stream of a video, like your YouTube or something, and you don't know how long the recording is going to go for. You can also say, for the connection type, you can say close or keep alive. That's used to say, when you ask a web server for a connection, if you're going to send multiple requests to the same web server, you can say keep alive, and then you don't have to open up a new connection every time. You can open up a connection, 
and then just send a, re send a request, get a response, send a request, get a response, send a request, get a response, etc. There's a lot of different HTTP header fields like this. These are just some of the more useful ones. So this is what an example HTTP request looks like. We can just type get slash then HTTP slash 1.1. So this says we're sending a get request. We want the root file. And we're asking, we're sending the protocol version HTTP 1.1. And as I said before, every HTTP message ends with two sequential new lines. So that's why there's one here and then one here. What we get back looks something like this. It says, I'm also speaking HTTP 1.1, 200, okay. That means I got your request and I can successfully fill it. It tells me what kind of server is running. So in this case, it's Nginx version 1.26. It's sending me data at this time. The data was last modified at this time. The content length is 16 bytes. It is text that's HTML. The connection will stay alive and other stuff that's not important. So let's take a look at what this looks like in the real world. There is a wonderful, let me make this bigger. There's a wonderful little utility called Telnet. Uh, this program was invented before, hmm, probably before I was born. And it allows you to connect to a, uh, to a web server, so in this case, google.com, or actually any server, any IP address. And you specify the port as the third argument. And so when I hit enter, it will say, trying to connect to this IP address. So it'll translate this name into an IP address. It'll say it's connected, and we're good to go. And I could type random stuff, and it will print out whatever the response was. So we see here, it says, trying to connect to here, connect to google.com. I type in a bunch of random stuff and hit enter. And it says, notice it's speaking HTTP 1.0. So in this case, the web server doesn't even know that I'm trying to speak HTTP 1.1. It falls back to 1.0, gives me a 400 error code that says bad request, gives me a content type, text HTML, gives me a content length, gives me a date, and then starts spitting out HTML at me, telling me what a horrible client I am for trying to send that kind of a request. So let's try again, and let's use proper syntax. We say I want to get the root directory uh, I'm speaking HTTP 1.1, I hit enter once, I hit enter twice, and it responds. And it spits out a whole bunch of JavaScript and HTML, a whole bunch, my goodness. But if we scroll up to the very top, we eventually get to the HTTP 1.1 200 OK. And it says, this is the date that you contacted me on, uh, this page that I'm sending you never expires, something about cache, something about content, here's a cookie that it's trying to set, here's another cookie that it's trying to set, here's the name of the server, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, lots of stuff. Any questions about all this? Okay. Um, Let's talk about using HTTP in C Sharp because, yes? So how does the server decide when to close a connection? That's a good point. So if we look at uh, the, if we look at the headers that are sent to us, so we scroll up, 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 right, aha. It doesn't say it. That's interesting. No keep yeah, there's no, there was no keep alive there. So, yeah, it's not telling us keep alive. So usually it will say keep alive or close under the. So if the server say keep alive, we will close. So if we wait for the client, for the client to close the connection, or it close the connection. Um, so all connections will eventually time out if nothing has been sent. And when I say nothing has been sent, I mean really nothing has been sent. 
So normally when I open a socket over here and I open a socket over here, TCP sockets, as long as I don't explicitly close them on either side, they will stay open. This can happen for hours until something interrupts them. The way they stay open is that they, every couple minutes, they send a packet out that says, hey, I'm still here, don't close your connection. And this one sends a packet back saying, okay, I'm also still here, don't close your connection. That's called like a heartbeat. Um, interestingly enough, that kind of a packet sending back and forth is the bug that was discovered in SSL recently, the heart bleed vulnerability that hopefully most of you have heard about. Um, that kind of a protocol where you're saying, hey, I'm still here, hey, I'm still here, hey, I'm still here, that kind of protocol is um, pretty common in internet services because you need to have some kind of heartbeat saying, uh, don't close your connection if you want the connection to always stay there. Because every time you open up a new connection, you have to set up, the, you have to do what's called the three-way handshake. The three-way handshake is where this person says, I want to connect to you. This person says, I received your, your connection request. Let's talk on this port. And this guy says, okay, yes, I heard you. We're good to go. Once, all, once those, uh, those packets have gone back and forth three times, then your session is finally ready to go. So it's kind of a bother to do that every single time you want to send a packet. It's much easier to do that back and forth once and then send stuff and receive stuff. Right. But HTTP will forcibly close the connection right after you make a request unless you ask for the connection to be keep alive. Keep alive is what enables... Let's find the keep alive part where I said it. Didn't I have something about keep alive in here somewhere? There it is. Connection type, close or keep alive. If, it's, if, we, say, if we send a request saying connection type, close, what will happen is we open a connection, I send my request, the server sends the response, and then immediately closes the connection. So they will never send that heartbeat to keep the connection open, and we will actually get a packet that says this connection has been closed, and if we try and write to it or read from it, we will read zero bytes, or we will have an error when we try and write. So if only if you say keep alive, or in this case, I guess Google has it turned on by default, the connection will say open, so that we can send a new request along the same connection. Okay, so connection type is part of the request or, or the response? Uh, both. both. So when I send the request, I can ask for keep alive. If the, re if the response says keep alive as well, then that means that the server supports it and is willing to do it. Yeah. If I were to send a head request, so here I send a get request. If I said head and said HTTP 1.1, then it will only send me the headers. If I say head HTTP 1.1, and then I say content, is it content or connection? Connection type, keep alive. Then does it respond with it? No, it doesn't. So Google just ignores me and just always does keep alive every time. Yeah, it's just always doing keep alive. So I guess that's the way that Google has decided to do things. Oh well. Uh, any more questions about HTTP and all this nonsense? If not, let's take a look at C Sharp and look at that read HTTP message now that we've gotten an idea as to how this works. So read HTTP message is a naive C-sharp way to read in a message until we hit a slash r slash n slash r slash n. So we pass in a stream socket, we build up a data reader, we tell the data reader, uh, we add on this thing called input stream options dot partial. This means that if I ask you for a whole bunch of data, if you don't have that much, go ahead and just return however much you have. Because internally, the data reader will add in some buffering, so it will say, all right, you asked for 1,000 bytes, but I only have 900, so I'm going to keep on waiting until I get 1,000 bytes, which is not exactly how sockets work at their innermost level. So we're saying, okay, don't do any of that buffering. We just want however much data has been given to us. 
So here, we get into a while true loop. We get the, we tell the data reader, I want you to read in one megabyte of memory. And then we get the number of bytes that were actually read in. So we wouldn't normally have to do this, except that we turned on this input stream options dot partial thing. Because we've done this, the amount of data that's actually ready can be less than one megabyte. This should say megabyte. We then check to see if we actually have any data at all. And we tell the data reader, OK, read in a string that's this many bytes long. And we call that ret. And we add it onto ret, which we have initialized right up here. We then, after we've read in a whole bunch of stuff, check to see if the last couple bytes were a slash r slash n slash r slash n. And if they were, then we break out of our while true loop. If ready length is less than or equal to zero, that means that we tried to load some stuff, but it immediately returned saying I have zero bytes. And that's the case where the server has actually closed the connection and we're able to just leave at that point. Okay. So that's how the raw TCP IP server and client work. Now let's learn about the nice way to do things with HTTP. So, using the nice way of doing things in C Sharp, we're going to use this class called HTTP Web Request. And we can tell this HTTP Web Request, hey, I want to create a HTTP Web Request for this URL. So we can pass in an URL, like google.com slash something. And then we can use this really long line to get, a, to get the response. So this response um, uses all sorts of different stuff. It's using templates where we have a type inside these brackets. It's using asynchronous stuff. And it's, we're passing in functions as data things. It's really kind of a lot of syntax to come uh, into your brain all at once. But the, um, the crux of this line and this line down here is that we're doing something similar to what we do with the normal uh, asynchronous stuff where we have an async function that returns like a, a task and then inside the brackets we have a type that we're promising to return, right? And then here we're saying, I want you to gather everything from the beginning of the response to the end of the response. So this function will automatically do all the parsing to decide when there's the beginning of a response and when there's the end of a response. So either the connection will be closed by the server or it will reach a slash r slash n slash r slash n, etc. Once we have that response, we can construct a data reader off of it like this. And then once we have that data reader, we're back in business. We are able to get the um, we're able to get the HTTP payload that's being sent to us right from this data reader, and we're able to get the headers and stuff that have all been parsed for us, and it's really, really nice. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Uh, this is the wrong file. Inside this solution, there's also this thing called HTTP client. It's got some XAML and some C Sharp. The XAML looks pretty similar. We've got a address that we try to connect to. We've got a port that we try to connect to. And we've got a file that we're getting from, that, uh, from this address. So we can ask for, say, google.com slash adg, like this. On the C Sharp side of things, we've got this get button click. And when we say get button click, we say, all right, we're going to grab the host name and the port and the resource. So this is host name, port, resource. We combine them all into one big string so that it looks like http colon slash slash www.google.com colon 80 slash adg. 
and then we say, all right, we're going to do this response equals task.factory.fromAsync thing, and that will give us the response object. Now here we're using a C sharp feature of this using thing. Using is just a simple way where when we enter this block of code, this response object will be equal to this, and when we get outside of it, the response object gets destroyed. So this is just a easy way for us to use an object and then destroy it once we exit the scope of this using statement. The reason why we do something like this is because this response object needs to be destroyed quickly so that we are free to make other HTTP requests and all that kind of stuff. This, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's about it. You don't have to have a using block here, but if you don't have the using block here, then you have to explicitly destroy the response object, and that's just a little more verbose. So we use reusing right here. Next, we construct a data reader off of that input stream, and we're able to use our read HTTP message function here again. Now, you may look at this and say, well, Elliot, I thought that we weren't going to be using this read HTTP message nonsense anymore. I thought that it was already going to be parsing the input and the output for us. That's because we're still using a slightly lower level uh, HTTP, um, HTTP library here. This HTTP rep request gives us the raw HTTP stuff. So when, if, when we run this code, we're going to run it on the emulator, we'll be able to see the HTTP headers and the HTTP body and all that kind of stuff. So if we ask google.com for ADG, actually, well, let's ask it for just slash first. It's page down. Hey, 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 hey. very nice, thank you. <laughs> then it says all this stuff, right? And the text turns green because we're actually able to, the HTTP uh, request thing will tell us when there has been an error. It will throw an exception. So for instance, if we ask for a file that's not there, it will say, error, the remote server returned an error not found. So this is nice and useful. Let's talk about the next level up in HTTP, um, in HTTP usefulness. We're going to create a new project, which is Visual C Sharp, Microsoft App, and we'll call it Nice HTTP Client. Now this client actually does not come with the basic Microsoft libraries, but it is still published on Microsoft, and it's in what's called a NuGet package. So this is something that, as you do your final projects, you'll probably run into. You'll want to do some C-sharp thing, and you'll want to get the code to do it. And they'll say, it's available as a NuGet package. And you say, what on earth does that mean? If you go to project and you click manage NuGet packages, there's actually a package manager where you can download pre-built libraries for everything that are published on Microsoft servers. And so here, we're going to look for HTTP client. And you can see there's an awful lot of stuff that shows up, like five pages of stuff, but the one that we want is Microsoft HTTP client libraries. When we say install, it will say you want to, these are licenses, I say I accept without reading them as always. And then it will download and install these packages into our project directory. This is really nice because now what this means is, let me go ahead and, oopsies, let me go ahead and just add in a text box so we can see what we're about to output. So we'll make this nice and big, and we will call it text output, as always. Now we go to our C Sharp file, and at startup, we're going to say HTTP client C. 
and it will say, I don't know what HTTP client is. And we will say, say using system.net.http. This namespace would not be available had we not just used our NuGet package manager to install a new package. So now that we have it, we can say HTTP client C, we'll construct a new one, and we'll say C dot, now I have to remember exactly how to do this. You know what, I don't remember how to do this off the top of my head. So this is a great example to see behind the scenes on how you learn how to do this kind of stuff. You just say HTTP client C sharp example, right? Very, very complicated. And you click on the first Google, uh, the first Google thing. And then you scroll down until you see something that looks like code. <laughs> and so this is what I was looking for. HTTP client dot get async. That's the one. So we open up the thing again, and so we say c dot get async. So we'll see that there's a get async function, which is going to send an HTTP get request. You can also type c dot post async, and you can send a post request. So this is, this library is breaking down the protocol into finer and finer bits, where instead of just having a stream where we can send data and receive data, we now have functions that are going to allow us to send the things that we want to send. So get async is going to take in a string that we see bolded right here. And let me go ahead and make this bigger because I didn't embigify it. I will say get google.com. And this get async thing is going to return a system.threading.tasks.task and then inside the brackets, HTTP response message. So because it's instead of a task, we know that it's, this is an asynchronous function, also because it says get async. So we'll just say response equals await c.getAsync. And actually, we're going to need to do this inside of a async function. So we're just going to make a do HTTP stuff function. Async void do HTTP stuff. All right, it's all good. Let's take a look at what response has inside of it. It's got this thing called content. That looks pretty good to me. So we're going to say text output dot text equals response dot content. But that's an HTTP content object, so it doesn't like that I'm trying to send it to a text string. So we'll say dot. There's a headers thing. And read as string async. That looks good. Await that as well. Response.content.read as string async. Let's see what this does. Probably crash, but let's see what happens. Of course, I need to set the right project. Nice HTTP client. We're going to set you as the startup project, and now we're going to run you. Ta-da! So, we went from like 50 lines of code down to three lines of code. The reason being, now we have a library that's doing all of the hard work for us. We can even get things that aren't just the content in a nicely readable form. For instance, there's this headers thing. And actually, we're just going to undo what I just did, and we're going to start debugging so we can see what this headers thing looks like because it's a slightly more complicated data type. This headers thing is going to be a dictionary. So if I look at, if I go to watch, and I type in response. Response has an awful lot of stuff available for us to look at. It's got this thing called content, which we're already getting the read as string async thing from. But it's also got this thing called headers. When you expand headers, we see that headers has all sorts of stuff. It's got age, cache control, connection, close, date, location, all sorts of stuff. Server, 
So it's all those lines that we saw in the HTTP headers. Now it's got it represented as a as a uh, object with fields that we can access, which is great. We've also got the request message, so we can see what we sent. We sent a get request. We asked it for for this URI, etc. We can see the status code. It says OK because it's an HTTP 200 OK message, etc., etc. All right. I'm sure you guys are all sick and tired of HTTP now. Are there any questions about this HTTP stuff? Okay. Let's talk a little bit beyond HTTP. Building on top of this transport mechanism from through which we can send bytes back and forth, we have to figure out what it is we want to communicate. And so in order to communicate more complex ideas than just here's a string of bytes or here's a string of characters, we need even higher level concepts. These are things like XML or HTML or JSON or whatever weird kind of protocol you can think of. In this case, we're going to be using JSON because it's really, really easy. There are, again, NuGet packages that we can use in order to construct JSON objects out of C-sharp objects. And we're going to um, use JSON because it's really, really widely used on the web. So for instance, when we want to do speech recognition with Google servers, we're going to send it bytes as audio data, and it's going to send us back bytes as JSON data. And this JSON data is going to have a format uh, that we will be able to look at and see what on earth our audio bytes correspond to in text. So, the Google Speech API that we're going to be using is a, located at that URL. So that URL has a, uh, is a specific script that gets run when I send a request to it. And the request that I send is a POST request. The POST request has data attached to it, and the data that I'm going to send is audio data. Now, I can't exactly just send it raw audio data. There is an option to do that, but it requires the raw audio data in a very specific format, and our phone doesn't give us it in that format to begin with. So rather than have hundreds of lines of code in order to convert it from one format to another, I'm going to send it in what's called FLAC encoded audio. FLAC is the free lossless audio encoder, and uh, it will take raw audio, where each byte corresponds to the amplitude of a single sample, right? We're all used to sample data right now. And it will turn it into a much smaller, uh, into a much smaller representation in memory. So something that used to take up hundreds of megabytes will now only take up maybe a few megabytes. Or if we're lucky, like one megabyte. This is really, really useful because transmitting a lot of data across the network takes up a lot of battery. So this kind of encoding is going to be really useful for us. In this case, Google won't even accept audio that's at a sample rate higher than 16 kilohertz unless it's been encoded because they know it's just going to be way too much data. We're going to send it the FLAC encoded audio and it'll give us back a JSON response of text hypotheses. The reason it's going to give us text hypotheses is because it doesn't exactly know what you said. It's guessing, right? So it's possible that if you mumble enough or even if you just say it as clearly as you can, but for some reason it doesn't do a very good job, it will send you back multiple possible sentences, each with its own guess as to how confident it is that this particular hypothesis is the true one. So let's take a look at the demo and see what all it looks like. First off, let's talk a little bit about JSON. Uh, so this is the Google speech test. It's a fair bit of code, so we'll take, a, we'll take a bird's eye view of it to just get an idea as to what kind of technologies are being used here. But first, let's talk about JSON. No, I really don't want to turn on sticky keys. All right, JSON looks a little something like this. Oh, please stop putting those in. 
No, it really doesn't want to. If, if I get rid of those, then will it? Nope. How about I do this? No. <laughs> All right. There we go. So, JSON looks something like this. It allows you to define things like arrays. An array of numbers would look like this. So if I send this text across the wire and treat it like JSON data, when I load it up in C Sharp, it's going to load it as an array of integers. When I want to send a dictionary where I have key, or say an object, where I have strings that correspond to um, that correspond to like uh, entries in an object, fields, I would send things like um, result. And then I can say one in, in uh, curly braces. And so when you receive this on the other side, on the C-sharp side, it's going to make something as if I had said like public class uh, my result. And then inside of it, I say um, public int result. Then it would, then when I receive it on the, C sharp side, it would do something like my result r equals new my result, and then r dot result equals one. So this object is doing the same thing as this. It's just in this case, it's whoopsies. In this case, it's being encoded as JSON. In this case, we're doing the same thing in C sharp code. So the beauty of what JSON is going to allow us to do is we're going to be able to take objects, turn them into text, and send them over the wire. And then when we get them on the wire on the other side, we can take that text and turn it back into objects. This is called serialization and deserialization. And JSON or XML are very popular tools for doing this. So let's take a look at what kind of JSON we get from... Um, from asking the Google Speech API to do stuff for us. So I downloaded a toolkit that will do this kind of stuff for us. Let me just remember the thing that I have to type to get it to work. There it is. So there is a, there is a um, file here called goodmorninggoogle.flack. And if we play this, It says, How are you feeling today? Good morning, Google. How are you feeling today? Good so it says, Good morning, Google. How are you feeling today? I'm not sure if you guys could hear that. Let me try it again. Good morning, Google. How are you feeling today? That's not me, but it's somebody else who has similar interests, I guess. We're going to take this command and paste it in here. Basically, it's going to do exactly what we're about to do with our C -sharp code. It will take that file, bundle it up as a uh, HTTP post request, send it off to that uh, URL on the Google servers, and then print out whatever comes back. So when I hit enter, it prints out two lines. The first line has the, this little bracket thing, and inside of the little bracket thing, it has inside quotes result, and then it has a colon, and then two empty brackets. So what this says is, I have an object, that object has a field called result, and that field result is an empty list. So this basically says nothing. Okay, great. What's the second thing say? The second thing says, I have an object with a field called result, and result is an array, and it's an array of another object, that object has a field called alternative, which is pointing to an array, which points to another object, and all of a sudden we lose track of where we are. So let's go ahead and copy this and put it into a text editor and spruce it up a little bit. Make it nice and big. The first thing we're going to do is just add in some indentation so we can see what all is going on. Maybe that's a little bit too much indentation. We won't we won't indent the uh, the arrays.
Okay. So what we have here is we have an object starting here and ending here. That object, here we'll put this on the other line. This object has two fields, one called result, one called result index. Result points to an array that starts here and ends here. Result index points to just a single number. So if we were building C sharp types and we call this first object type root object, then we could start to say, okay, public class root object. And the root object is going to have a result that's a list. So we'll say list result. And it's going to have an integer called result index. Int result index. Everybody following me so far? Great. We can start to dig deeper. Inside here, there's this alternative thing. Yes, question? How do you know zero is not an integer, not like a string? If it was a string, it would be surrounded by quotes. That's part of the JSON spec. Anything that's a string is surrounded by quotes. Any like numeric letters that aren't surrounded by quotes are integers. It doesn't go into like whether it's a 32-bit integer or a 16-bit integer. It's just an integer. So it's up to the people who implement the spec to make sure that everything's big enough. But in general, I think everything's just like 64-bit integers and stuff like that. So this alternative thing, we can start to say, okay, public class al alternative object, right? And this guy's got a list called, al called alternative. And it's got a Boolean called final. Actually, I think uh, I think it's capitalized in C sharp. And then uh, and then well, actually, this shouldn't be called alternative object. This should be called like result object. And then finally, we have another object inside here called alternative that has inside of itself a string called transcript and a float called confidence. So, this is a list of result objects. This is a list of alternative objects. Any questions about this? This JSON up here is what we receive. This stuff down here is what we're going to get out. Because we want to be able to access this stuff that we're receiving in a native way. Luckily for us, there are this is something that a lot of people have to do. So there are some really neat tools for doing this kind of stuff. So I'm going to minimize this. Go open up Chrome and go to json to c sharp.com. json to c sharp.com says, give me your JSON, and I will give you your c sharp, <laughs> which is awesome. This is really, really nice. Can you go the other way around? Uh, no. And this is why you can't go the other way around. There's a lot of stuff that you can represent in c sharp that you can't represent in JSON. JSON's pretty simplified. All you have are objects that can be built out of strings, integers, floats, and booleans, and arrays of those things, and that's it. Most of the time, when you're defining these kinds of protocols, you're going to define the like shared like wire format first, and then you'll define how that uh, appears on different hosts. Because I can send this object to like an Android phone running Java, or to a computer running Python, or to a computer running MATLAB. You know, there's a whole bunch of different, uh, J JSON is really, really ubiquitous. So I'm able to send this to pretty much anything I want. All right, so that's exactly what I have right here. I've got these classes that are made from that JSON to C sharp thing, where I just got an example JSON file, I shove it into this JSON to C sharp thing, and it builds me a bunch of classes that allow me to uh, parse that JSON into native C-sharp objects. So let's make these guys small. 
let's take a look at the XAML and see what on earth this application looks like. We've got a go button, a progress bar, and a text output. And what happens when we run the application, and uh, sometimes it crashes. I still haven't figured out why, but I'm sure I will. I'm pretty sure it's because sometimes Google just doesn't like to play nice with me, and there's an error that I'm not catching. If I say, Google, please play nicely with me, we see that the recording bar is slowly filling up, and when it hits the end, it will either stop or I can press the stop button right here. It then does this processing thing, sends off to the Google servers to get a response, and it will print out all the hypotheses that it's able to get. It is taking an awful long time processing, and then it crashes. <laughs> and the reason it crashes is because the result object that it's getting back is null which is pretty bad. So, there's a couple different reasons why this can happen. The reason why it just happened right now, I'm pretty sure, is because Google has tightened down on the maximum length that you can send to their servers, so I think my progress bar is too long. Let's try a shorter, let's try a shorter one. If we just say, test one, two, test one, two, then it works a lot better. If I say, I'm a little teacup, short and stout. Then I said teacup, but it says teapot. So what we see here is that it has had multiple hypotheses for what it just got back. The first one is I'm a little teapot, short and stout. And it's completely white because when we get that confidence number, I'm assigning that to the redness of the text that I'm outputting. So this one it's very confident about. These ones it's not confident about at all. And it says I'm a little teapot, short and stout. It's got the I'm without a capitalization or a apostrophe here. I'm actually surprised that it differentiates between the two. Here it's got I'm a, where it's all one word. And here it has I am a little teapot, short and stout. So we've got all these different kind of variations. But typically, when you're doing this kind of thing, you would only want to pay attention to the one that you're most confident about. But whatever. Um, and so we can try it again. Live speech recognition demos are really fun because they often break. <laughs> Life speed recognition demos are really fun, free Austin break. <laughs> and so on and so forth. You guys can have fun with this in your, on your own time. But that's the functionality of what's going on. Let's take a quick tour through the code to see if we can understand everything that's going on. So if any of you guys want to use this in your final projects, you can. The first thing that we have is on Navigator 2, we start up Sound.io just like we're used to. In Sound.io audit in event, we check to see if this.recording is true, where this.recording is this Boolean right up here at the top. I guess I should start here. We have a libflack object and a Sound.io object. We've got a list of float arrays called recorded audio that we're initializing to be just empty, and we've got a Boolean called recording. When recording is true, we take the data that we've been passed in with SIO audio in event, and we add it to the end of this recorded audio list. So this recorded audio thing is a linked list of objects that are of type floating point array. So when we say recorded audio dot add, we just take that chunk of data and we put it onto the end of our linked list. We then up update our progress bar using this dispatcher.begin invoke nonsense, where we take our recorded audio dot count which is the number of uh, buffers that we've stored, and divided by 10 for some reason, so I guess that puts it up to, uh, I guess we can go from 0 to 1,000 buffers of audio. So 0 to 1,000 buffers, that's 10 seconds of audio, maximum. Because each buffer is going to be 100th of a second. So this is how I have implemented keeping track of a, whole, of a big amount of data. Just to do a little bit of math to figure out exactly how much data this is, if each buffer is 480 samples, we're storing 1,000 buffers of them, and each sample is 32 bits, which is 4 bytes, then that comes out to 
make that floating point. That comes out to 1.8 megabytes of data. So 1,000 buffers, 10 seconds of data, just raw data, is 1.8 megabytes. So if you were to record a minute of data, that would be like 8 megabytes of data. OK, let's go ahead. Oh, one, one final thing. Once we hit the 1,000 uh, 1, buffers limit, we call stop recording. So we will stop ourselves if we reach that far. Start recording sets this start recording to true. We set the go button to say stop, and we say the text output to recording. On stop, we do the exact opposite. We say this start recording false, and then we do text output, progress bar, all that good stuff. Hi, do you for now. In our, uh, sorry, in our stop recording button though, whether we press the button to stop recording or it gets called because we hit our 1000 buffer maximum, we will call this function called process data. Process data is right down here. Process data first takes our recorded audio, which is a list of floating point numbers, or sorry, a list of buffers of floating point numbers, and we'll turn it into one giant floating point array called raw data. That's what this flattened list thing does, and it's not very interesting, so we won't look at it. We then clear the list so that if we wanted to record a new one, we aren't appending to the end of a list that already has a bunch of our dulcet tones. We then call lf.compressaudio, so that calls our libflack object and tells it to compress the audio. We pass it in the raw data in floating point form. We tell it our sample rate, and we tell it how many channels we've recorded from. So in this case, that's 48,000 kilohertz and one channel. We then call this function called recognize speech. And if recognize speech returns us something that has at least you know, one or more objects, then we output them all and set their foreground color to red, depending on how, how much uh, confidence they have, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. This stuff is not very interesting. It's just outputting text. So let's take a look at recognize speech and see what it looks like. Recognize speech takes in the byte of flat encoded data and a sample rate. And we say, all right, web request.createHttp, this thing we do recognize. We say, we're sending our content type. So here we're setting our HTTP headers. The first header we set is method. We say it's going to be a post method. It's going to be a post request. And our content type is audio slash x flack rate, and then we say sample rate. So in our HTTP header, we're telling the web server, this is the kind of data I'm sending you in my post request body. We then do this weird, you know, tasks.factor.from async request.begin get request stream thing that we saw previously for, for reading data in. But in this case, we change a couple of the words from, uh, from, res from response to request. And so we're able to write out our flack data in the stream that's given us from this function. So previously, we used a, a function like this in order to get a object that we can use to read data in from the server. In this case, we're getting an object that we can use to write data out to the server. And so we say stream.writeAsync, we pass in flack data, and we pass in flack data.length. So that's where we actually write out all the flack data to the server. Here, we then ask for the response. So we do that response equals task.factory.from async business. And we have this response thing that we can construct a data reader from. And then we do everything that we've been used to. We have this uh, dr.inputStream options. We say, OK, give me data. We get the string. And then we do some interesting stuff. The first thing we do is we're going to split the string by its new lines. So what I mean by that is when we get data out, we're getting data that looks like this. It's two lines. The first line is an empty result. The second line is a result with a bunch of alternatives and stuff. I'm not yet entirely sure why we get an empty result at the beginning. That could be a bug in Google's code, or it could be some weird quirk in how I'm submitting the data. But this first result is empty, and we want to ignore it. 
So the first thing we do is we take our string, which is all of that stuff combined together, and we split it on new lines, which means that whenever we reach a new line, we split it into two strings, and we keep going and split and split and split every time we reach a new line. So what that allows us to do is it takes our, what I call response strings combined, which is what I get from just reading straight from the data reader, and we call this split function, which is going to return a list of strings. We tell the split function, okay, I want you to split on a slash r slash n, or just a slash n, and then we do a for each loop where we get a string out of that, um, out of this array of strings, and we're going to do something for every string within that array of strings. So this is a way to do our processing where we do it once for every line that we get out from the server. Inside this for loop, we then say, okay, deserialize the object as of type recognition result, which if we zoom all the way back up to the top, recognition result it are, is the root level object from that JSON to C sharp thing. So this is where we're finally closing the loop, going from JSON to C sharp, down here. And we get this root object. And then we say, all right, if root.result.count does not equal zero, then return it. Otherwise, we're going to continue on in our loop. So that means we loop over all the lines here until we find a result object whose alternatives are not empty. And then there's a bunch of common code out here that doesn't matter. And it's gone. Any questions about how this whole thing fits together or why it was built this way or anything like that? Okay. How does that deserialization function convert things into the objects you declare there? Are they from the same provider or? They're not actually. They're not from the same provider. It knows because I pass in this recognition result object type to the deserialize object function. And so it will look at the recognition result object type and it says I've got two things, one named result, one named result index. And it knows the type of these things. So when it comes here and it says, all right, result index is equal to zero, it will say, is there an integer in this recognition result object type that's a type result index? or this, this integer that's called result index. And it'll find this one, it'll say yes there is, and then it'll assign the value. And then it will say, all right, I've got this type called result that is of type array that has all this junk in it. And so it'll say, okay, do I have something that's of type array? Yes, I do, result. What is the, what is the uh, type of the list elements? It'll say, okay, it's a result. So then it will go in here, and it will say, is there a Boolean called final inside each object inside this array and keep on going and keep on going and keep on going. So at each level it's getting a object type trying to match up the JSON uh, field names with your C sharp object field names and if it can't do that it'll throw an exception. But if it can do it then it just returns the object filled out. Okay, uh, so we know that the C sharp code can get the class information at the wrong time, right? Yep. Okay. Yep, exactly. Lots of reflection. He asked if C sharp code can get object information at runtime. What that means is if you pass me an object and I and I'm a function that takes in objects of many, many different kinds, and I want to know what kind of fields I have in that object. So if I if I don't know that there's this thing called transcript and confidence inside of this thing called alternative, if you pass me an object of type alternative, there are functions in C sharp that I can call that will return transcript and confidence. I can call a function and it'll say this object has fields that are called transcript and confidence and transcript is a string and confidence is a double. That's called reflection because it's like the C sharp is looking into a mirror and seeing its own reflection. It's able to examine its own code at runtime. It's pretty complicated stuff. We're not going to be touching that at all. We're just going to be using code that uses it. 
Okay. Um, with that, that's everything that we're talk that we're going to talk about about HTTP and web uh, request and response and things like that. Are there any questions about this kind of stuff? Is there anything that you really wish I would have gone into in deeper detail or something that I that's related that you didn't hear about or anything like that? Yes? Um, what other services does Google have, like speech recognition? Where are they? What, what other ones does it have? Oh, gosh. Um, how do you find out? An awful lot. So Google Web Service List is a pretty good way to search for it. It's got, they've got a products thing here, but okay, some of this stuff is not that easy to find. For instance, this voice recognition thing was only found because Chrome has a voice input thing right here, right? I can say allow, and I'm going to say, like, uh, find pictures of horses, right? Pictures of horses, here you go. <laughs> So the way people knew that this thing existed is because you can do things like tell Chrome, I want to see what kind of HTTP requests you're sending. So I can say, show me all the events, and it's capturing events right now. And so then if I go here and I say, um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> then over here, we can see all these URL requests, right? So we can see here there was a request made to google.com slash speech API slash full duplex version one key equals blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. And this is how people found out about it because it's not actually a public API that Google gave out. It's something that Google lets people use and puts a usage limit on things for, for but you kind of have to search around and see what other people are doing and stuff to find out about this. I found out about this because I did web service uh, for speech recognition. Nope, speech recognition. I can't type. <coughs> and this is the first one that pops up, right? Because Microsoft doesn't have an open service for this. Neither does um, Apple. Apple has their own proprietary stuff where Siri will connect to its cloud and do encrypted communication and stuff, same with Microsoft. We could use Microsoft's speech recognition APIs on Windows Phone 8, and we can, and that's possible, but it doesn't really use HTTP, and we don't have as much control over it. We can't send whatever kind of information we want. We just say, this is a speech input, and so when the user touches it, automatically it'll start recording from the microphone, automatically it will send it to the cloud, automatically it will get text back. So for our purposes, if we wanted to send uh, data that we've recorded previously, if we wanted to alter the data at all before we send it in for speech recognition, all that kind of stuff, we can't do that. So that's why we do it this way, because we have total control over everything we're doing. Any other questions? All right. With that, we're done for today. I'm going to be upstairs for any questions you have about homework or final projects or anything like that. And uh, if, you are, if you already have a phone Astro device and you have multiple ones in your team, I would like you to please return to me be, uh, all except one so that I can redistribute them to the teams that really need multiple ones because some teams don't have any. Thank you, guys. See you upstairs. Thank you.